Yeah, I would just like to introduce Professor Mike Munger. Yeah! Um, now, Professor Mike Munger is one of the world's foremost public choice economists. Um, he has a PhD in economics um, that he got in 1984 and then worked at the Federal Trade Committee and, st and started working um, at the Federal Trade, Trade Committee, then started teaching at Dharma's College, followed by the University of Texas. Um, and then he started working at Duke University in 1997, becoming chair of the political science department uh, for over a decade. Uh, Professor Munger is a prolific writer and his book Analyzing Policy, Choices, Conflict and Practices is now, standard, um, is now a standard uh, textbook in the field of policy analysis. In 2008, uh, he was a Libertarian Party candidate uh, for the governor of um, North Carolina and he was also featured in the famous Fight of the Century, uh, Keynes versus Hayek, which is a great video. You should all watch it if you haven't already. Um, and so, yeah, the last time I saw Professor Munger was um, in Fremantle last year for the uh, Lip Freedom to Choose conference, and that was a terrific speech. I'm looking forward to this one. <laughs> Professor Munger. Well, thanks. Thanks so much. I appreciate being here. Um, I do want to start out by saying we're going to raffle this excellent book off, and right after lunch, it will be given away, which probably is actually its market price, but <laughs> the book is, is Choosing in Groups. That's not that damn funny. Um, it's called Choosing in Groups, I, I, it's Cambridge University Press, and it's an introduction to some of the more technical sides of public choice. If you are interested, then please give a business card if you're a professional, or a scrap of paper if you're not. Um, to one of the conference organizers. We'll have the drawing during lunch, and then we'll have a gala award ceremony, which will consist of me giving it to you. <laughs> so um, I do want to give a brief tease about my talk for tomorrow, which will involve puppies, <laughs> and some older puppies, and your prime minister taking a selfie with a puppy. <laughs> but first, let me tell a parable. A public choice parable. Now, those of you who listen to uh, Econ Talk have actually heard this. The, if you listen to the podcast Econ Talk, but Tron Santiago is a bus system in uh, Santiago de Chile, and the reason I tell it is that it illustrates many of the things about public choice, which if you find the rest of my talk rather <coughs> boring and technical, you'll at least have something where you can say, all right, I understood that example. So, um, Tron Santiago is the public bus system, and here you see it's a, a large bendy bus, a large Volvo bendy bus. Um, Santiago is a city of six million people. It's in a valley. They have problems of uh, pollution. And they were distinguished by the fact until 2007, they had 3,000 private bus companies. That is, all of the bus companies were private. There were no, there, they had a public metro or subway system, but all of the bus companies were private. But it was diagnosed as being a problem. And after the new system, Transantiago, the public system was introduced, many people were upset with that. And here you see that subete means uh, get on, and someone's making fun of the way that the, the system was working. <clears throat> so that's the way the system is supposed to look. Nice, clean buses, be able to carry bikes. This is the way that it actually did look in 2007. The average commute time had been about 40 minutes under the private bus system. When the public bus system was introduced, they almost immediately went to an hour and a half average commute time, which is catastrophic for the poor people who have no other way to get to work. For the wealthy, it's really not a problem. They can take their Mercedes out of the garage and be able to drive, but and the intent, one of the reasons that San Santiago was so interesting is the intent was to help the poor. And it ended up damaging the poor quite a bit. I'm gonna take off my jacket. I was wearing it when I came in, which fulfills the terms of my contract. <laughs> and for those of you that are worried, that's as far as I'm gonna go. <clears throat> so in February of 2007, 
this was the scene of people trying to get on buses. And you've probably been tried to get on the subway here in Sydney sometimes when it was a little bit crowded. This is a whole different level. And many people would leave their homes at 4.30 in the morning to be able to get there under the new supposedly superior public bus system. Well, why had they moved from a private bus system to a public bus system? There were two claims. One was greed and the other danger. Now, the problem of greed was that the private bus companies were making in the aggregate about $60 million per year profit, and the fact that they were making profit was seen by many as they must be charging prices that are too high, because if they're making profits, it should be possible for a state system to do that without making any profits. Second was danger, because there were a lot of accidents because curb rights were common pool. Now, is common pool resource a phrase that you have encountered? What is a common pool resource? An example is a marine fishery where there's a lot of fish in the sea, but you can have as many trawlers as you want, and we end up overfishing it because there's no property rights. How could that be true of a bus system? Well, imagine that three blocks away, there's a bus stop with 30 or 40 passengers, and there's three buses at a stoplight. This is an actual photo. Uh, OK, that's actually the chariot scene from Ben-Hur. But that was the way that the private buses were behaving, because whoever got to the bus stop first got all 30 passengers. That really actually is a problem. A lot of ab abuelitas in, you know, the old ladies in the crosswalk with their walkers were being run down by buses. So there was a property rights problem that they were going to try to fix. More on that in a moment. So they decided to publicize, because of those problems, they decided to publicize the system using those huge Volvo Bendy buses, having monopoly routes for the buses, and having a hub-and-spoke system. And the hub-and-spoke system is actually pretty remarkable. What do you know about a bus system under the private system that was profitable? What do profits mean? Are they a sign of greed? <coughs> it means that somebody is offering a product at a price that many people find useful, and providing that service is sufficiently efficient that you actually have some revenues left over afterwards. Now, what the city could have done was look at the routes that were being run profitably and saying that, from a Hayekian perspective, gives us information about which routes we should run. Being economic planners, therefore, and knowing far more than the market, they did nothing of the kind. <laughs> what they did instead was to implement a hub and spoke system, because when they drew this on the map, it clearly looked more efficient. So you would take a bus to the metro, take the metro, and then take a bus. Whereas before, there was a lot of redundancy in the system. You could take a bus all the way from your neighborhood to where you worked. And that was a big part of the reason that the average commute times went up. Now, the planner said, that's not what we intended. The poor people who had their commute times go up said, we really don't care what you intended. What we care about is what actually happened. Intention is not a defense, although so often, good intentions of the left are used as a defense. Well, as I said, that sort of picture, I, I used this picture a number of times before I realized it says la, la misma wea, and la misma means the same. We could translate wea as the same old thing, but actually it's a more, it's, it's a, a much less acceptable interpretation. Um, when the great day came, February 10th, 2007. Usually, when I'm in the Northern Hemisphere, I have to explain that February is like August and everyone's on vacation. But y'all are already down with that. So, But they, they did this in August because everybody was on school break. And there was not uh, the, the, the amount of traffic that they expected was much less. Everybody was at the coast, the Vina del Mar, or Concon. So when they implemented them, even on the very first day, the average commute times went way, way up. There were fights. Uh, it was very difficult for people to get on the bus. And this went on for months and months. Now, remember, the two problems have been green, greed and danger. And their solution was to publicize. The reason that that was a bad idea was 
that they hadn't studied public choice. They threw away the information of routes. They ignored the problem of incentives. They thought profits were a bad thing. And the question is, did that fix the problem? Now, you probably have a guess that it didn't, or I wouldn't be talking about it. I already talked about the problem of routes, that they threw away the information that they had. But it does seem like the old system had an incentives problem. And they did replace the incentive with a new one. The new incentive was that bus drivers would be paid based not on how many passengers they picked up, but on whether they were on time. Now, some of you can probably think this through, even though you are not trained city planners. <laughs> What's going to happen if you pay bus drivers based on how on time they are? <laughs> well, Yoda might say, stop, they will not. <laughs> And they didn't. They didn't stop. I myself documented this some in 2008 and 2009 because the authorities were denying, even two years after it started, they were still denying that it would happen. So I would take my cell phone and video bus after bus going past because the bus was half full, but there's 30 or 40 passengers. And that means that it's going to take so long for the bus to load, the next guy behind him will be able to go past, and he will then be on time. He won't be punished. I will if I stop. But then if I don't stop, there's even more people at the, at the bus stop, and it gets worse and worse. That's one of the big reasons that the average commute time went up so much. The question is, and the, one of the reasons the planners denied this is that it was impossible. Remember before, bus drivers worked for private companies, which meant they were greedy. But now they work for the state, which must mean that they behave morally and care only for the public good. <laughs> because that's what people who work for the state do. And the planners had looked this up. It said so. <laughs> well, they were very frustrated by this. Eventually, after almost five years, they managed to change it. Um, so that the incentive system uh, actually did give drivers some incentive to stop. The point of that parable is that public choice would teach us that incentives matter regardless of whether you work in the public sector or the private sector. So if you take only one thing away from my talk today, it is that the key inside of public choice is that people are people. Incentives matter. Now, it is quite true that private market incentives and public incentives may differ, so behavior may differ quite a bit. But people are largely the same. Public choice then would deny what we might call the progressive conceit. And the, the progressive movement in the United States was one of the, the priests was John Dewey. So the state has the responsibility for creating institutions under which individuals can effectively realize the potentialities that are theirs. Social arrangements, institutions are made for man. These arrangements are not means of obtaining something for individuals, not even happiness. They're means of creating better citizens. Individuality in a social and moral sense is something to be wrought out. So the idea was that if people were good, then all we would have to do is have a public system and things would work better. So one debate that you often see is, are people good enough for socialism? Well, one of the big, I, 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 I could pause. So the, but there, there is a serious and actually terrifying point to that. Because if people are not good enough for socialism, what do we need to do? We need to make them good enough for socialism. We need education, even if it means that we will take the intellectuals and send them out to camps in the country. Because we need a transformation of how people conceive of their role in society. So citizens are confused, largely helpless. Elites are selfish and conniving. But somehow, citizens become competent if they enter a voting booth. So these are, too, these are people that are too stupid to be able to decide what cheese to buy without assistance. But they can easily choose a president or a public policy. And elites become saints if they enter public office. And they also become geniuses that are capable of deciding what public policy should be. Now, I have a colleague who's a friend of mine, actually, at Duke, named Dan Ariely, who wrote 
uh, book called Predictably Irrational, and he's a behavioral economist. He's a lead leading behavioral economist. And he writes, and with some plausibility, that people are not smart enough to do what they need to do in markets. That is, so much information is required that they're not smart enough to do what's required in markets. And I often debate Dan on this. And he's actually changed that claim a little bit because his usual claim is people are too dumb to do what market require of them, therefore, the state. <laughs> My claim is that every flaw in consumers is worse in voters. Every flaw in consumers is worse in voters. Now, it's true that I may not know enough information to be able to decide what sort of car to buy, but I can always look at consumer reports, I can look at reviews. Suppose I go to the voting booth and I'm to decide which candidate for office I am to choose. Where would I go to look up what they're going to do in office? Furthermore, since my vote doesn't actually determine the outcome, my vote when I'm buying a car determines the outcome. The car that I pick, that's the car I get. When I'm choosing a president, president that I choose may or may not be, and it won't matter what my vote is, so my vote is more of an expressive act, and I am free to vote what I wish were true rather than what is true. So every flaw in consumers is worse in voters, which means we have two not very good systems to choose between. Public choice has three main components. The first is methodological individualism, and this need not be moral individualism. It could be methodological in the sense that we're choosing individuals as the locus of choice. They might choose because they belong to a cult, and they'll all choose in much the same way. But still, individual by individual, they have to choose. Second, citizens are really no smarter than consumers because they're actually the same people. So we can't assume that they will have more information or behave differently, except to the extent that the incentives they face are different. And then politicians are no more moral than corporate CEOs because they are also essentially the same people. Now, it's certainly true that they will make claims to the extent that voters are seduced by the fact that the politicians say that they actually love them and want only what is good for them. But they are not essentially different. And then last, and this is the thing that I think many people forget about public choice, is politics as exchange. That is, in spite of all that, it is still true there are many things we have to do together. That the institutions of choice that we choose, that we select, the constitutions that we live under, and the bureaucratic and other procedures that we depend on to deliver services are essential. We can't really get around them. It's just that we shouldn't make unrealistic assumptions about what's likely to happen. So it may be true that the old system in Santiago needed to be reformed. We really do need a mass transit system that will work, and it's not clear that markets left to their own devices will be able to solve problems of public goods and externalities. However, the assumption that automatically the state is the best alternative institution for policy delivery is probably mistaken. What you need to do is think of things case, case by case. So the idea of politics as exchange is the core of James Buchanan's work and is the core of this lovely book that will be given away in a raffle at its market price. <laughs> in the sense that groups of people might come up with an agreement where they are obliged to contribute some share to the joint enterprise. Now, we might or might not call that share that they contribute taxation, but it means that they can voluntarily contribute provided that actual consent is achieved. So the problem that public choice raises is that voluntary exchange always makes both parties better off. Voluntary exchange, by definition, always makes both parties better off. Otherwise, it wouldn't be voluntary. Well, there's no reason to think that exchanges need to be bilateral. Many exchanges might be multilateral. We might be able to work together in groups. But that probably means that we need institutions other than simple market institutions to allow us to do that. Public choice is about the study of rules. Public choice really is about the study of rules. Economics is about the study of commodities and consumer behavior. Public choice is about the study of rules where the rules are themselves the object of choice. 
The rules are the object of choice. Which rules are better? We have preferences over rules, but we need information about the engineering principles behind them. So public choice is a kind of social engineering, but it's a kind of social engineering that's involved on consent, not planning. It's involved on, with consent. So people, in, in an informed way, consent to the rules because they understand their implications and believe that they will be better off in living in that sort of system. The three origins in public choice, and I, let me say I'm happy to, I'm going through a lot of stuff here very quickly, I'm happy to share this PowerPoint also at its market price of zero. So just send me an email at munger at duke.edu, M-U-N-G-E-R at duke.edu, and I'm happy to send you this PowerPoint because I'm gonna go through it quite quickly. There are three original schools of public choice, Virginia, Rochester, and Indiana. And then I'm gonna talk briefly about five different problems of public choice. We're gonna have all this done. I need to be done by one o'clock, is that right? <laughs> I wanted to see if Tim's head would explode. So Virginia public choice is a bit like, in a way, but it's also different from Chicago economics. Jim Buchanan and Vernon Smith were interested in the study of rules and the choice of rules. Virginia public choice is related to Austrian economics, but it's, it, it's, it, it studies non-market institutions. Rochester public choice is the study of social choice, of different kinds of voting rules and the use of game theory. Indiana public choice, we would associate with particularly the Ostroms, uh, Lynn Ostrom, the first woman to win a Nobel Prize in economics, and the study of voluntary arrangements that people have come up with to provide public goods. So if you have groups of people who are in, an, in a, a, a game, a strategic setting, where there are market failures, but they are there for an indeterminately long time, it's remarkable how often people are able to solve the public goods problem through voluntary cooperation. And what Eleanor Ostrom did, I compare her sometimes to Darwin. Darwin went around the world looking for strange beaked finches. Lynn Ostrom went around the world worked looking at institutions that let people voluntarily solve the public goods problem. And the study of those gives the lie to the fact that market failure, therefore, the state. The five problems, first, the information problem. Now, the general problem of the information problem was identified by Hayek. Hayek, in his 1945 AER paper, identified markets, the, one of the key features of markets is providing information through prices. Prices give us information about the relative scarcity of resources which means that I can do something important. It is a moral mistake for me to use something that someone else values more. It is a moral mistake for me to use something that someone else values more. But how would I know that you value it more? Well, the price tells me. If I value something at 10 and you value it at 30, there should be a way for us to engage in a mutually beneficial exchange. Is there anything like that kind of discovery process in politics? Well, we use voting, but as we've said, every, prob every problem with consumers is worse in voters. So the information problem that we face in deciding what an economy should produce is actually even worse in deciding what a state should do. And that aspect of public choice in the study of bureaucracy, uh, in externalities, in cost-benefit analysis are all important areas of research and study. Second, the democratic coherence problem. <clears throat> Some of the, the thinkers there, the Marquis de Condorcet and Borda during the French Revolution, Duncan Black, Kenneth Arrow, Gibbard and Satterthwaite, the theorems that they put together. There's two problems that are really quite different. One is that some voting systems are better than others. All of us recognize we need some discovery process to, to decide what it is that voters want. But the problem is, rules matter more than they should. One of, the, one of the great discoveries of public choice, which is pretty easily summarized, is rules matter more than they should. All right, like two thirds of you are asleep. <laughs> Wake the hell up, I'm talking. <laughs> rules matter more than they should. Remember that thing, rules matter more than they should. Because we want democracy to be based on the preferences of voters. But what I'm gonna do is illustrate that the idea of the preferences of voters may actually be incoherent, which is the second problem. 
If there's three choices, three choosers in disagreement, then a majority may be opposed to every alternative. Democracy may be rock, scissors, paper. How many of you have seen Condorcet's Paradox? You know Condorcet's Paradox? A few. Well, good. The next few minutes will be well spent. So the problem that we have in politics is that usually we have to make one choice from among many. That is, if we have a policy, the policy is the same for everyone if the rule of law is satisfied. If we're trying to decide what we're going to have for lunch and we go to a restaurant, everybody can have something different. If we live in a democracy and we're trying to decide what defense budget we're going to have, we can only have one because the defense budget is what it is. So we have to choose one from among many, which means that we're always going to face problems of disagreement. Now, the difficulty that we have is to create out of disagreement a consensus. We must create out of disagreement a consensus. Rousseau famously asked, how can it be that a man is both free and yet bound by wills not his own? Well, Rousseau's answer is, was that we agreed to the rules. Since we agreed to the rules, we are in effect consenting to the outcome. And then Rousseau would go on to say, well, we didn't actually concede to the rule, could agree to the rules, of course, but it's tacit because you live there. All of which could be said for a slave. Slave must have consented to slavery because he's living there. Well, remember, public choice focuses on actual consent. But there's still a problem because if we have three choices, three choosers in disagreement, democracy may be radically incoherent. So there's a kind of category mistake that we sometimes make, which says that if there's such a thing as the majority, we can discover it through a voting process or some other political process. And here's the category mistake. I know what it means to say I want. I know what it means to say Dr. Thrasher wants something. But what would it mean to say we want something as a group? Why would groups have preferences? Why would groups have preferences? What we have is decision rules and outcomes. But there's no reason to expect that groups would have preferences. So the idea that the government should do what the majority wants means that the idea of the singular majority is in some way a coherent intellectual concept. So let's do a test problem. And if we had more time, I would do this as an actual exercise. And believe me, it is loads of fun. I would hand out little pieces of paper. And the little pieces of paper would say what your preferences are among three alternatives. Suppose that we are going to be trapped here for a month. Now, you can go to the bathroom. Just, it's, a, it's an example. It's not real. <laughs> but suppose that we have to be here for a month, and if we all pool our resources, we will be able to buy one boxcar load of food. And our three alternatives are apples, broccoli, or carrots. Quite nutritious. We'll survive. We won't be happy. <laughs> but we can buy either apples, broccoli, or carrots. The problem is that we disagree of the relative merits of apples, broccoli, and carrots. And when I hand out the little cards, normally when I do this exercise, I'm creating disagreement. It's quite possible that there's actual disagreement. There's some people who like broccoli, some who don't like it, and so on. So if we don't choose, we will die. So let's assume that everyone prefers one of these three alternatives to death. That might not be true. I'd rather die than eat broccoli, say some people. <laughs> But let's suppose that that's not true. You would prefer life from any one of these three. What we have to do is choose one of them. And we recognize from the outset that we're going to disagree. Many people are not going to like whatever it is that we choose. They have to be willing to accept it and not kill the other people and eat them. <laughs> so it requires unanimity in the sense that only if we pool all our resources can we buy a box car load of one. But the unanimity is about the choice process, not about the outcome. It's about the choice process, not about the outcome. We have to agree on a choice process. And the three choices are apples, broccoli, and carrots. And just to make sure, what I want you to do, if we were doing the exercise, is actually to vote. So just to make sure that it's clear what we're talking about. <laughs> So what we might do is each person could choose, but that's not what's meant by democracy. It might be that we could fund enough so that people could buy their own with vouchers. But what we have to do is there's so, much, so many economies of scale, we have to choose one. So we're going to pool our resource, resources and choose. And let's suppose 
if I tell you the little cards that I were to hand out were one of these three types. Somebody likes apples best, broccoli second, and then carrots. Somebody likes carrots best, then apples, then broccoli. Somebody likes broccoli best, then carrots, then apples. Each of those is a plausible preference, preference profile. If we went around, somebody in this room has each of those three preference profiles. I just, it's not true that they occur in equal proportions and that's the reason that I hand out the little card to ensure that we have actual disagreement. So the problem is, given disagreement, can we create a consensus? That's the public choice problem. Actual consent, not tacit consent. Can we agree on a rule knowing that we disagree? Can we agree on a rule which, when an outcome results, we say, all right, I accept that. So remember this picture. And so you'll notice here that if I were to choose a procedure, we have to have some, some procedure. <coughs> and we have apples, broccoli, and carrots. And you'll notice that broccoli and carrots are vegetables. So let's pick one of the vegetables first and then vote that against the remaining, which is a fruit. So here we go, are you ready? Broccoli versus carrots. If we all voted, I would say, how many in favor of broccoli? And all of the type one people would raise their hands and all of the type three people would raise their hands. So two thirds of you would vote for broccoli, which means that we prefer broccoli to carrots. We prefer broccoli to carrots as a group. And then I would say, all right, let's vote that against apples. Well, type one people prefer apples to broccoli. Type two people prefer apples to broccoli. Only the poor type three people prefer broccoli to apples. So two thirds of you prefer apples. Apples is what we choose. And the result is apples. And we have rejoicing from the apple lovers. <laughs> but of course, the type three people really hate apples. But we decided because we voted. Is anyone's spider sense tingling? <laughs> Was there a problem with that voting procedure? I already warned you, rules matter more than they should. They ordered that against you? How could that possibly matter? Seven's bigger than five. Five is bigger than three. You want to know whether seven's bigger than three? What I'm saying is uh, who <clears throat> the question between the uh, vegetables and the uh, broccoli. But that's perfectly logical. Yes, I'm not disagreeing with that. <laughs> so you're, you're saying if I had a different order, we'd get a different outcome. That's just yeah. obviously nonsense, right? No. OK, fine. Let's suppose, that, <laughs> let's suppose that Mr. Three says beforehand, knowing that this was going to be the procedure, I volunteer to do all of the extra work associated with being committee chair. <laughs> because I am selfless, and I care about you. I want to make sure we do this the right way. And what I think we should do, and notice that Mr. Three likes broccoli best. And what Mr. Three might say is that two of these, carrots and apples, contain pretty high sugar content. And so what we should do is choose between the things that have relatively high sugar content to make sure they don't split the vote, and then we'll vote it against the relatively bitter alternative, which is broccoli. Everyone says, all right, that makes sense. It's just as logical as my procedure was. And so we're going to vote first apples versus carrots, which means apples versus carrots. <coughs> carrots win from the twos and the threes. We then vote carrots against broccoli. Well, broccoli wins, carrots win, broccoli wins. And broccoli is the outcome. So just as you said, if you have a different order, you have a different outcome. And since we have preferences over outcomes, we have preferences over orders. If you get to choose the order, you get to choose the outcome, which means that control of the agenda is tantamount to dictatorship. Control of the agenda is tantamount to dictatorship. Now, you might object, wait, we voted. Well, imagine with me that it's 1974, and you go to the ballot in the Soviet Union, and you have two choices. I would like to vote for Leonid Brezhnev. I would like to be shot in the forehead. <laughs> I'm going to go with the Brezhnev thing. Well, that's not democracy. Suppose instead you go to the polls and choose between two alternatives selected for you by someone else. Is that democracy? It is not. It is dictatorship with the trappings of democracy. I can get any outcome that I want simply by choosing the order that results in that outcome. 
So there's a different way to think about this, which is the majority. There's three majorities. There's the majority that prefers broccoli to carrots. There's the majority that prefers carrots to apples. And the majority that prefers apples to broccoli. Which one should get their will? They can't all get their will. There's a second problem. And that is a majority is opposed to every alternative. That's the scary one. There's a majority opposed to every alternative. So. Going through that procedure, just outlining it. And I can get the outcome depends on the order, as I said. So by changing the order in which we consider the alternative, I can generate as the winner any one of the three alternatives. Choosing the agenda is tantamount to choosing the outcome. The problem is, whenever there are three or more alternatives and there's disagreement, then democracy is radically indeterminate. Democracy is radically indeterminate. Some majority opposes every alternative. There's a feasible alternative that, would, that I prefer more. Now, I've talked about one problem with that, and that is that agenda control is tantamount to dictatorship. That seems bad. There's a bigger problem. The majority is opposed to every alternative. Suppose we solve this somehow. We have some kind of different decision rule. Someone comes in. We have consultants that choose a, an, an alternative. Somehow we choose one of these three alternatives. Which one would it be? Suppose you're a nutrition expert. Which one of these three should it be? It's probably broccoli. Let's suppose it's broccoli. So we say, oh, well, thank goodness. We got around this problem of democracy with technocracy. Experts told us what to do. We go out in the hallway, and people say, yeah, you know, broccoli, but I actually like apples. You like apples, too? We count up, and a majority of us prefer apples to broccoli. And so we kill that <laughs> bastard. <laughs> we throw him out the window. Ah! He's dead. All right, the people have spoken. <laughs> apples. We go out in the hallway, we're having some tea, and someone says, yeah, apples, I really like carrots. You too? Let's kill that guy who suggested democracy. Ah. How long does that go on? As long as there's anyone left. <laughs> a majority is opposed to every alternative. There's actually a, a, an ontological problem there. It's not that there's a right thing to do and the state fails to do it. The state is incapable of making this choice if it uses majority rule, which is why I accuse my good friend Dan Ariely, the behavioral economist, of being a fascist. <laughs> I mean, you might as well go right for it. Because <laughs> clearly what he wants is a dictatorship of technocrats. And the sort of technocrat that he means looks a lot like Dan Ariely. <laughs> I'm an expert. I've studied this. You should do what I say. Well, we end up with dictatorship then with the trappings of democracy. And democracy without limitations, without some sort of rules, is actually a kind of tyranny. Does anybody recognize the era from which this was taken? 2011. <laughs> Probably 2018 in the US. French Revolution. That is the French Revolution. Between the period of 1792 to 1794, the most dangerous thing to be in France was in charge. Because ah, ah, there were heads falling off. They weren't throwing the body. He's holding up a head. So everyone would try to become a leader so they could get ahead. <laughs> I, I apologize. <laughs> well, the reason that there was a problem was that there was an, a majority opposed to every alternative. What was the outcome? What was the result of this period of chaos, of democratic indeterminacy? It was Napoleon. 
Of course, this could never happen now because we understand problems of democracy. No, we don't. We have the same sort of problem. How many countries have gone from being dem democracies to dictatorships? Egypt, Russia in many ways. There's an attraction of dictatorship that you cannot explain by using the sort of political philosophy that focuses on justice rather than engineering principles. The main thing that you should be concerned about, and I've done work in Chile and a number of countries that have made transitions to democracy, the problem is recognizing the engineering principles that prevent either cycles or a military coup when they get tired of cycles. Democracy is radically incoherent if there's three choices, three choosers, and disagreement. And that condition is generic. Now, most places solve that problem, that survive, that, that stay democracy. They solve that problem with a constitution that largely limits the set of things that majorities get to decide. It's almost the opposite of what we say, majorities should be able to decide everything, and that's democracy. What actually we mean by a successful democracy is a place that finds ways to limit what it is that majorities can do. Because what happens over and over again otherwise is a reversion to the sort of entropic state of politics, which is democracy. It's very difficult to write a constitution that keeps you from reverting to chaos, which always causes dictatorship. So the difficulty that I see is the apparent inability of many policymakers to learn from the lessons of public choice. I'm going to stop there and ask if there's any questions. Y'all were awesome. Uh, uh, great talk. Uh, um, back to the slide on uh, that had uh, one, two, A and B. You had. Um, Politicians uh, were no more moral than CEOs, and uh, citizens were no more smarter than consumers. What about what? I particularly know, want to know what Danny Ariely thinks about that. Politicians are no smarter than consumers or citizens. You know yeah. what he thinks. What he thinks is, uh, what we should do is create teams of experts that will make all our choices for us. And if we were smart, that's what we would choose. The fact that we don't simply delegate all decision-making authority is evidence that we're actually not capable of making our own choices, and should we, we should be forced to do that at gunpoint. Now, I admit that my summary is infelicitous, and that he might not agree with all of its details. But in fact, that's the only solution that he has, because, and I have to admit that a bunch of my Duke colleagues recently, since November, I don't know, 8th, have come into my office, closed the door, and said, okay, you were right, okay? I understand now, because for 16 years, first throughout the Bush administration, then throughout the Obama administration, I was saying this grotesque expansion of the powers of the center, of the president, should terrify us. And my Democratic friends agreed all the time that Bush was in office. But then as soon as Obama was in office, you know, it's really not a problem. He's doing the right thing. Yes, he's ignoring, like, the Constitution and stuff, and he's been ruling by degree. But he's doing the right thing. And now they would say, I'm not so sure. But it, it is a problem if you're going to say, we're going to delegate authority to experts, and it is irrevocably dedicated, what that delegated. What that means is then the contest to appoint the experts becomes politicized, which is what we in the United States have seen about the Supreme Court and about the Food and Drug Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency. It's not surprising that politics metastasizes. It breaks out of the, the realm of politics into the realm of the selection of experts. Selection of experts by democracy is not a way out. You need full dictatorship, which is why I have the picture of, of uh, Napoleon on a motorcycle. Plus, it's just a great picture. <laughs> so, last question. Uh, excellent talk. Um, as an American libertarian, I was really excited when the Libertarian Party started to actually get more of a foothold uh, in this last election. But now uh, I see that having a third option just means more people will just be trying to get ahead. Should I be concerned about the things to come? Uh, or Yes, I can. Yes, I can. <laughs> 
Or is the laws that we have about not murdering each other for our differences going to be the, the, the unifying rule that we all follow? Or do you actually see the emergence of the popularity of the Libertarian Party in the US as a sign of good things to come or bad things to come? Well, the, the best argument for us is them. That is, the best argument for the Libertarians is the two state-sponsored parties we have in the US. And I wish the argument were not so persuasive. But I actually know Gary Johnson pretty well. I, I've campaigned with him a fair amount. He got almost 3%. The most libertarians ever got before was 1%. So in some ways, both because of the success of Gary Johnson and because our government sucks so hard, this is a golden age for recruitment among libertarians, provided we would dispense with our fetishizing markets and emphasize instead, as I'm going to talk tomorrow, about voluntary organizations, voluntary private action, the larger group of things that we can find ways to organize and to help each other rather than fetishizing markets. I'm trained, I was catechized as an economist myself. I can fetishize markets with the best of them. But the, the perfection of markets is not our best argument. It's the imperfection of the state. And we need to use the imperfection of the state as the very persuasive argument that it is. I think that's how we can win. And our time is up. Thanks so much.